uh, for your uh, for the introduction. And so I think Farooq already mentioned my research interest, so I'm not going to uh, bore you by saying uh, repeat, uh, repeating those again. So instead, uh, let's look at some interesting uh, interesting facts in the in the in the cybersecurity domain, and especially like uh, we have digital assets. And how do we enable computation? Because computation is one of the comp com uh, component other than storing and managing. So, so in this talk, basically, uh, I would uh, give some motivation and some application scenario where we need to protect protect digital assets. And then, what are the techniques we can use to protect those assets? And then I'll conclude my talk by giving some uh, giving some uh, like applications, uh, uh, some real world applications. So, so what is a digital asset? So a digital asset is anything in digital form that has a value. And digital asset means different to different uh, individual. For example, for a personal, uh, uh, for an individual, it's not only about cryptocurrency or the final or the 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 banking uh, financial values. It's beyond that because. We also care about our uh, uh, personal information, so which often we quite often we store in our uh, phone. We also use phone to different uh, different activities through different apps, and we also care about our uh, health information, our genome data, our biometric data. So, so the similar thing are also true for uh, business because business care about customer information. They also care about the data they are generating or collecting. And what they are using for the uh, for uh, marketing uh, uh, for marketing their business. So for business, any information that really matters to the uh, uh, that uh, really matters to the business. So for the government, so government care about uh, uh, pay, uh, citizens' uh, private information, employment record, tax record, etc. That means we see the uh, digital assets are different for different entities. And what we do with these digital assets? We uh, typically store. We just don't. We just don't want to, you know, store them and retrieve them. So their uses are beyond that. Quite often, we need to perform operation on them because we are collecting them that, uh, because we want to do something with them. And these cyber attackers are looking for this information for business data, government data, personal information, healthcare data. What are their motivations? So motivations, basic uh, motivations are depends on the target. For example, if we think of a business, then their motivation, uh, business uh, asset, then their motivation could be financial gain, or for the political, uh, for the government data, maybe they want to deliver, uh, they want to do deliberately to bring out some political agenda. So there are different uh, 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 types of data breaches are happening. For example, in 2019, so the attacks on LifeLab was for the ransom, and that attack basically revealed 15 million customers' uh, private healthcare information, such as addresses, uh, such, uh, su such as their home addresses, login password, date of birth, healthcare, etc. And in 2000, there have been some uh, some notable ex uh, some notable examples due to COVID are online classes basically this online class it's a learning platform so they due, due to a cyber attack 1 million students in uh, personal information were out so and some another notable example is in the south africa uh, so there is a bank called post bank because of some employees internal employees stolen some uh, stolen a master key and because of that they had the bank had to replace 12 million banks credit card and many more examples so if you do a quick, uh, quick Google search, then you can see uh, the, uh, the cyber attacks are happening maybe almost every day. So and these attackers are not always the outsiders. That means they are not always the external attackers. There could be internal attackers. For example, these post bank, the employees are were, uh, were uh, covert. They were malicious. They behave maliciously. They stole it. Uh, they st uh, stole the master key. So the, there are two. Uh, there could be external adversaries and internal adversaries. Now, there. What are the common causes for these cyber attacks? So, for, uh, especially for the outsider, for the external attackers, 
maybe there may be some security flaw in the identity or access control management or the information management system or quite often there are poor authentication and authorization mechanisms deployed in the IT system and often uh, the users choose weak passwords and uh, because of that uh, their record can get uh, hacked and other than that there is a big reason that is often these documents or whatever digital assets they are stored at a central place maybe a central server so if an attacker is successful in hacking the server then it's all the documents are gone that means and the reason is the single point failure so far we have seen there are several uh, our society in our society we are creating digital properties and adversaries are targeting for uh, targeting for those documents for some interest but the question is why are we creating such digital property because our society is moving towards data driven society so what are the benefits of the data driven society because we want to have a stable financial system we want to have affordable health, uh, affordable and efficient healthcare we want to have a functioning uh, government so this is a cover page uh, uh, from an article by alex pentland who is a professor at mit and he is also a, a computational social scientist so i really like this quote so the digital traces we leave behind each day reveal more about us than we know so this could be a privacy nightmare or we could be the or it could be the foundation of healthier more, more prosperous world so let's think in positive way so can we uh, can we have a healthier and prosperous prosperous world by leveraging data while protecting their privacy so this data driven society i'm going to give you some small uh, some example for example let's consider there are different uh, uh, like you know uh, over the years uh, billions of dollars of transactions frauds are happening so and if the banks jointly work together on their data on their on their transaction fraud data we have algorithm to design transaction fraud uh, detection uh, system but the question is they need to have the they need to collaborate their uh, they need to work uh, in a collaborative manner by sharing their data at the same time for these financial institutions the data are important because it might reveal uh, customers purchase habit location what kind of purchase they are making then uh, there are many more information so if such a system we can design by sharing data then there we can save billions of dollars at the same time there if the financial uh, if the healthcare institutions work together then we can uh, then we can by sharing the patient's data uh, or healthcare record there we can have improved uh, improved uh, uh, improved diagnosis techniques we can uh, the doctors can understand disease better and there could be better treatment so by sharing the data there could be a better world uh, world can be created so now we'll look at uh, so this is the uh, motivation part of the talk why why the why do we need to protect data or or protect our digital assets but in the next uh, in the following uh, uh, in the following part of the talk i'm going to show you uh, some motivating example how can we uh, how can we protect uh, such digital assets and how can we enable computation on them let's think uh, let's think of uh, in the in our physical world uh, we have some jewelry we have money we have some uh, some uh, important document if you want to protect them what do we do we go to, quite often we go to bank and we rent a safe deposit box and in the bank basically uh, and we pay maybe uh, 5 bucks per month and uh, what what bank does bank basically put your document or whatever asset you have in a box that's the safety deposit box and give a key to you and they keep one key because what they're doing because uh, they do, they don't trust you at the same time you also don't trust bank because bank would you know bank may replace your jewelry by something else because it might be hard to detect and at the same time bank also doesn't want to give you the full access because you may go to bank any time and you can get your uh, uh, get your uh, asset out and you can blame bank so that bank needs to be uh, paid to you uh, later the, that's why 
they are basically sharing this key. So what, what, uh, what about the digital world? So in the digital world, we want to adopt a similar uh, solution. So let's say we have some sensitive uh, digital asset or digital uh, digital document. We want to share among a multiple servers. Even if let's say there is a we have a sensitive uh, sensitive uh, uh, data S and there is a, some magic uh, sharing algorithm and it creates a share uh, and it is given to all these server. And even if your some of the servers are compromised, your data is still safe. That means no one can any adversary can extract any information about the secret data. OK, this is uh, this is working fine. But if, even if we need to use the data, then what I'm going to do? Or what we need to do? So that means we need to uh, we, we need to share data in such a way so that we can do computation on them. So let's look at one example. So this is an uh, this is an authentication. Authentication is quite common. I mean, it's very common in the identity management system. Let's consider a uh, tiny example, uh, 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 a, a, a toy example. Let's say there is a client who basically wants to authenticate a server. Then what it does, and uh, uh, and the authentication is done through a key. So what the server, what what the client does, client encrypts a message. Hey, it's Bob. Let me uh, give access to my uh, uh, to my staff. So he basically encrypts the message, uh, encrypts the message with its key, which is basically pre shared with one server. And and send the message and ciphertext to the server. And if the server can compute the same ciphertext, then the authentication is done because the key is only known to the cloud. Now we assume that the key is distributed among two servers using simple XOR operations. And these K1, K2, they are chosen randomly and they are given to two servers. So we can do the same thing. What needs to be done in the authentication process here in the right hand side in the step one? They need to perform the encryption in a distributed manner. If we can so if we can do this, then we can basically achieve the same functionality as we are uh, as uh, we are we were doing before. And we are also increasing the com uh, we are reducing the risk of uh, risk of the cyber attack because if the cyber attacker uh, attacks one server, my keys are still protected. None of the information are leaking here. So I hope you got the idea. So. Basically, our uh, uh, our uh, so that means we need mechanism to do these uh, to do the operation in the distributed manner over the over the shared documents, which individually does not leak any information. So now, so secure multi-party computation is an area which basically, in principle, allows a uh, an arbitrary number of users to jointly compute on their pr pr uh, private data. Uh, any function without revealing their input. And in secure multi-party computation, basically the computation is done over a network, over a computer network. A set of computers, they are basically holding their input and they want to jointly compute. So if you go back to this example, uh, go back to this example, here basically you can think of an encryption function is computing in a joint manner where the key shares are, uh, the, uh, key shares are shared among a set of servers. So over, and this computation is done over network. So this computation scenario is basically preventing both adversaries, the internal adversaries and external adversaries. What we already have seen some example before. So now there are different techniques. So uh, we'll uh, I, so in the you know, in the uh, in the following part of the talk, we are going to see several compu uh, these comp confidential computation technique where the input is co uh, confidential and uh, these techniques. So uh, I'm going to briefly show you the idea or what are the tools available so that we can design better systems. So one approach, uh, one, uh, one famous approach is the Gerbil circuit approach. So which basically, which is based on the symmetric key, that means uh, symmetric key uh, algorithm, uh, symmetric key uh, crypto primitives. That means we need only the encryption or a hash computation. That is a uh, secret sharing based approach. And many of you may be familiar with the fully homomorphic encryption app, uh, uh, encryption where you can perform computation over encrypted data and a new uh, a new approach is uh, trusted computing so which is becoming popular and which uh, quite works for the remote server computation cases now i'm going to uh, show you uh, how does an uh, garble circuit approach let's say we have a function you can think it is an encryption function and it gives to, uh, it gets two inputs x and y 
So what do we need to do? So we cannot compute this in like a typical uh, typical RAM program. For example, in a high level language, what we do, we convert our high level program, for example, C to a binary code and we execute in the CPU. It doesn't work like that way. So what do we need to do? We need to convert the functionality into a circuit, which is represented using, for example, XOR and a not operation. And there are two entities, let's say Alice and Bob, they want to jointly compute this function F, then what they need to do in order to securely com uh, compu uh, compute the functionality by, uh, by protecting their input, they need to evaluate each gate securely in the, in the circuit. And this each secure gate evaluation is equivalent to performing some encryption operations over the, over the keys. And these keys are random keys, where basically we import the input value, binary value 0, 1 to some uh, random keys. So this is how the, uh, this computation is done. So the, the primitives we need are encryption and there is an oblivious transfer. So this is, uh, I'm not gonna introduce uh, uh, that here. So this is how we can do. So basically we can solve the problem of distributed, uh, uh, distributed computing. So another approach is, so here, let's say Alice, Alice has an input X and Bob has an input Y. So Alice shares it input uh, uh, into two parts. So you can see this red color, is corresponding to the Alice's share, and this blue color input is corresponding to the Bob's. So that means, let's say, and again, we need to you know, represent the functionality in form, of a, of, in form of a circuit. Either it could be a binary circuit or an arithmetic circuit. So for, a, for example, for a binary circuit, that means they need to securely evaluate the gate. Again, because we represented the functionality, because we, uh, we needed to represent the functionality in form of a gate. And this magic, this, uh, this square box for a gate takes four inputs, uh, uh, two from Alice and two from Bob, and it computes two shares, these uh, two outputs. So one is corresponding to the Alice, that red color, and this blue color is corresponding to the Bob. So the computing, the a, XOR and NOT, so they are very cheap. They can be done locally without any interaction. But the not gate computation is a bit expensive because in order to compute that, they need to exchange some information because right now the data are not in the simple form because right now they are in the shared form. So we can still uh, do, uh, if, uh, do this computation efficiently using oblivious transfer or prefer triplet or there are other methods. That means again, we can without, uh, when we are computing this, we are not a single bit of information is leaked about the input. That means we can purely protect the privacy of the inputs. So now uh, 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 I'll uh, briefly explain the homomorphic encryption. So this homomorphic encryption technique, it's a, it, uh, it works quite well for the computation outsourcing uh, scenarios. Let's say Bob uh, has some encrypted data, which is uh, at the server, uh, which, is, um, which is sitting at the cloud server and Bob wish to, uh, compute some function and wants to get the result because Bob may not have enough computation capabilities. And so that Bob asks Cloud, oh, please compute on my, uh, on, my, uh, on my encrypted data, the function F and send me the encrypted result. When this is the, done, the, the, uh, uh, the, the result is encrypted as well as the inputs are encrypted. And during the computation, no information is leaked. So this basically protects against the cloud server as well as if my cloud, if the cloud is compromised by some uh, by some hackers or something, they are not learning any information about the data. And when the when Bob gets the encrypted result, he just simply decrypts it because the decryption keys uh, keys are known only uh, uh, the key is known only to the Bob. So why that why the cloud can uh, compute this because the encryption scheme has property of homomorphically computing the addition and multiplication operation use from the cipher, uh, using the ciphertext. And it's not on, uh, uh, so this quite, uh, so this is basically the first scheme of FHE came in 2010. And in the last 10 years, there has been a tremendous progress. So there is a open consortium called homomorphicencryption.org uh, so they are so this is an initiative from industry government and academia 
to develop a unified and simplified API of the homomorphic encryption scheme so that the experts as well as the non-experts can use them to develop applications. And in the last 10 years, there have been several uh, such uh, open source packages for the homomorphic encryption have been developed. And some examples are HELIB, Microsoft SIL, and uh, uh, LOL, and so on. And it's not only that, there have been research going on to accelerate FAG computation using hardware power. Because this uh, this uh, uh, QHE is an GPU accelerated uh, homomorphic encryption, but in the recent recent years, these schemes are implemented in FPGA because servers are quite often connected to an additional FPGA where to accelerate the computation. So these schemes are being implemented in FPGA in order to accelerate its computation. So it's very likely that in the nearest future we are going to. Uh, so this this will be uh, this homomorphic encryption scheme will be deployed uh, and and to be used uh, uh, to develop applications. So now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the secure remote computation. So you may have heard about the uh, trusted computing, for example, uh, Intel SGX. So this uh, so this is a general problem definition. So if we have let's say there is a this uh, you know the icon with man. So this is basically he has some uh, has some data and there is a, this green icon is basically some software provider. So so and they want to the uh, the, uh, the basically the data owner wants to get some software support and wants to run its uh, run the software on his data in a remote computer, for example, a cloud. So. So the data owner. Uh, uh, what it does, it sends its data or whatever code he has. It just send the encrypted code to the to the to this remote computer and uh, in uh, in collaboration with the software provider and the secure and the data and code are run here and when they send it so it's it is sent in the encrypted form so that the remote computer or the cloud server who is holding that does not learn any information uh, information about the code and data and the data owner gets the result it's encrypt, uh, gets the encrypted result and it decrypts to see the, the clear text result. So these are the two important components in this in these settings. So this is basically a computation dispatcher. It's basically dispatch the computation to the remote server by setting up some keys and sending its encrypted data. So this approach basically provides the confidentiality and integrity in computation as well as in data. So we'll look at an, uh, an example of this scenario. So which is basically Intel SGX because there are other technologies as uh, available for AMD uh, ARM. So I'm just uh, considering uh, Intel SGX as an example. So what Intel SGX uh, is doing, they're providing some high level instruction set. So high level of API using that we can run our code in the in the remote server. And if we look at the security settings for the uh, for the remote uh, remote server, so what we trust, we are trusting only this hardware, this piece of hardware, which is the CPU, and that implemented the uh, there is a memory encryption engine, which basically protected here. So and whatever data we have, we keep in the RAM, so they are all in the encrypted form, and this part is called the enclave. So this enclave containing the code and the encrypted data. Because CPU has the limited number of register, it cannot hold your you know, big chunk of data or code uh, in the CPU. They need to interact with the, uh, with, the, with the memory. So when the computation is done. So that means we are trusting only this piece of, uh, only this piece of uh, hardware. So, and with this, we can achieve the, uh, the confidentiality and integrity guarantees. And with this, we can high, uh, we can prevent several attacks such as uh, bus snooping attack. If an adversary is snooping the bus or the memory, we can prevent those. But we only need to trust this, uh, CPU, uh, only uh, trust this CPU. So there are several uh, technologies available to design, uh, to design, uh, uh, to design a secure and trustworthy system. So I have presented here uh, several uh, techniques. Uh, and these techniques are uh, one particular technique is not suitable for all application because some are suitable for uh, 
one application, maybe some others are suitable for different applications. So with these techniques, what we can do, we can design secure storage and digital asset management system where we can protect, protect our cryptographic keys and we can protect our data. We can protect uh, uh, and such examples are uh, like uh, uh, protected identi personal identifiable information, our health information. We can also design secure uh, digital identity management system. One example I have shown the authorization and we can also do the confidential uh, computing. Like for example, we can provide privacy in the data driven uh, data driven society and we can we can uh, perform uh, data analytics, secure data analysis analytics on the private data. And uh, and uh, basically we can we can do various uh, uh, different uh, we can develop various uh, secure and trustworthy uh, information processing and the data management systems. So this is how I would like to conclude my talk. And so here are some uh, references and I would like to thank uh, those people who created those wonderful images and icons that I have used in my slide. And now the floor is open for the questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.